you, uh, Matthew, and uh, to John also, and uh, happy Sabbath to you all. It's uh, good to be here. I want to start by uh, just speaking a little bit about something that happened last Saturday night. I uh, went out for dinner with my siblings. I have two brothers and a sister, and their spouses were there, and uh, also one niece and her spouse and her daughter. So there was 11 of us, and I was sitting next to my younger sister, and we struck up a conversation about many different things, but we spoke about a, um, a particular problem I've been grappling with of late in my health. Uh, recently, my doctor gave me a bit, of a, a bit of a fright regarding a condition I'm suffering. And I, as I spoke with my sister after quite a conversation, I, I came to realise that after 22 years of this condition I have, she still didn't know what it was. She's a, a, she's a nurse, she understands medical terminology, and she was insisting, with, we all sort of had an argument about the, the name of this condition I suffer. And um, she said, you've got such and such a condition. I said, no, that's not what it's called, it's called this. And she kept insisting that she knew what it was when I knew very well what, what I was correct and she was wrong. And it really struck me and it was, it was almost quite... Um, well, I felt actually hurt that one of, the most, one of my most favourite people in the world uh, didn't understand the condition I've been grappling with for 22 years. She had uh, a misconception or she had a, an assumption that she knew what it was when in fact she didn't know what it was. And it really made me think about how well we communicate when we talk to Anybody? How effective is our communication? How well are we getting across what we're trying to say? Uh, is there something about the way we are transmitting? Is there something wrong with the way we are communicating? Or is there something wrong with the person who's uh, our intended audience, whether that, whether that be my sister at the dinner table beside me, or whether it's an auditorium full of people, or whether it's a, a colleague at work or a person on the train, or whoever it may be, is there something wrong at that end of the communication process? And uh, even though I don't want to get into communication theory today, uh, I guess it's something we have to be mindful of that communication is something that requires not only just speaking words and perhaps not only showing slides, or using effective body language, but other factors must be taken into account as we seek to get across to somebody else something we want them to understand. And so this experience last Saturday night was, it, it quite shook me up because my medical condition is serious. Uh, I, may, I may come across as uh, healthy looking and um, that's probably because I carry a little bit too much weight, it fills up my cheeks and makes me look well. But um, it was quite troubling that uh, I had, in only three months ago, I had spent a long time conversing with my sister about this particular problem, and I thought I had her full attention. I thought with her feedback I was getting that she understood what I was saying, but it seems that I was wrong. And it really made me think about the more significant um, aspect of communicating and that is communicating the gospel. You know, it was a little bit disappointing that she didn't quite get what I was trying to say, but more importantly, how effective are we in communicating the gospel? What sort of things may interfere with the process of communication? What sort of things ought we be aware of? And when you think about uh, Bible texts such as Matthew 28, 19 and 20, where it's called the Great Commission, where Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations and baptise them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them all things that I've shown you. You know, that, uh, that commission that God has given to the Christian church to, to share this good news that God has given to us, that we have found, we've discovered through somebody else's communication most likely. Or perhaps even where it says in Matthew 24, 14 that... Uh, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached as a witness unto all nations and then the end shall come. 
you know, God is, uh, has placed himself as dependent upon us to fulfil that task, hasn't he? Go therefore, do this task, communicate the gospel to the people of this world, teach them all the things that you've learnt from the study of the scriptures and uh, in so doing you'll be preparing a people in readiness for the coming of Jesus. Now this is something of eternal consequence. You know, it's the eternal well-being of these people that God has commissioned us to, to go to. Now, whether we are going to people in our own family or neighbourhood or workplace or whether we're sent as missionaries to other parts of the world, we're to go. And we are called upon to communicate the good news that God has given to us. And so he has, um, I believe, um, placed himself... Um, how could I say, he's, he's, he's called upon us to do this task. He could use other methods, of course, uh, using angels or he, himself, and he did, of course, send his son Jesus to the world to communicate this gospel message to us. But he's made himself uh, indebted to us to help fulfil this task, to help the people prepare for the coming of Jesus. Now, if you want to uh, undergo a, a pretty steep challenge... Try understanding this. Um, I've been a Christian for almost 30 years. I was a fairly diligent Bible student before I gave my heart to the Lord. So several years of uh, reading and studying the Bible before I actually became a Christian. I've uh, done four years of formal or five years of formal theological study. Uh, I've been a pastor for almost 15 years. And uh, this book is still a very, very challenging book to get your mind around and understand. And now there's various reasons why that is so, but nonetheless, I think all of us would agree that if we were asked to explain some aspects of the book of Revelation, we would really struggle. There are some parts that uh, are quite clear to us. As a, as a denomination, we, uh, I guess we could say, pride ourselves on being a people of prophecy. We are a movement that God called into being and our task has been to present the end time gospel message in the context of Jesus' second coming. And so getting our minds around what God has revealed through the book of Revelation is a, is a deep challenge that we uh, all would grapple with. But I want to just share just a brief few thoughts from the introduction to this book by way of providing a model of communication, the way in which God has communicated his heart what's in his heart and mind, what it is he wanted to communicate to us here today. And we look at this first uh, chapter here of Revelation, the first few verses, and use this as a bit of a model to uh, build on that we could perhaps utilise some aspects of this. So first of all, it starts out by saying, these are the very first words of the book of Revelation, saying that it is the, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, what does the word revelation mean? To make it open, to be revealed, to um, make plain. It's certainly not implying anything about being hidden or difficult to understand. It's the opposite, isn't it? It's, uh, it's intent the intention is that we are receiving something that God has disclosed to us. And it's the disclosure is about Jesus Christ, isn't it? It's the revelation concerning Jesus Christ. Now, there are some theological implications for this, but just to keep it simple, the book of Revelation is a book containing a disclosure about Jesus Christ. Is that fair enough? That's quite plain. Okay, so the second uh, phrase says that this revelation of Jesus Christ was given by God to show to his servants. So God gave to Jesus to show to his servants. To show, it means he wants us to give evidence of or proof of something, to make known something, similar to the word revelation. So God has given it to Jesus to show to his servants. And his servants, we could include ourselves, the leaders of the church, and uh, the world wants to know what it is that God has shown. Or God wants the world to know, I should say, perhaps, the other way around. It goes on to say then that, he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. So when we think of these terms sent and signified, I guess the sent part would be to say we'd, it's been delivered. 
We send, a, we send a letter in the post, we send an email, we send a text message, we communicate by sending the actual message to, our, to the recipient. And it says here in this passage that God sent it and signified it. Now, to signify something is to put it into signs or symbols or code, uh, and we would say perhaps words. Words are a form of signs and symbols, aren't they? We use it in everyday language. Of course, it's, it's so everyday to us that we don't even think about it. It's just the, it's the way we just communicate. But the book of Revelation is somewhat different in that it's not just communicated in words, it's communicated in word pictures. And God, in fact, uh, didn't speak all of these words to John to record in the book. God, in fact, uh, showed him visions and dreams and he saw images of, of various things that he then described. He put them into human language. God, God communicated to him in a, in a miraculous way, a supernatural way. And he showed him things. And uh, I'll come back in a few moments and just elaborate a little bit further on this point. But God used various means and ways of communicating the message to John. Through Jesus and his angel, the leaders of the church were then to communicate that on to the church members, the members of the various churches that received these letters. It goes on then to say that John bore witness to the word of God. So the word of God being the message that had been sent to him and he then bore witness. In other words, he proclaimed it, he preached it, he spoke it, he wrote it. He communicated on just as he had been commanded to do. And so you see this quite elaborate, well perhaps not elaborate, but a, it is a process of several elements that bring the message that uh, originated in God's heart and mind down to the place where we can then receive it. We can hear it, we can grapple with it, we can, by God's grace, understand it. And then, of course, with understanding comes the opportunity to act upon it. And so this is the process that uh, is unfolded here in the book of Revelation at the very beginning there. And then it concludes this passage by saying, so that uh, John bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. So he elaborates there even more uh, talking about what he'd seen regarding or concerning Jesus Christ. And so when we look at, the, I mean, one clue here as we begin to open up the book of Revelation to study, to understand what it says, we need to first of all uh, keep in mind that it is the testimony regarding or concerning Jesus Christ. So we're going to be looking for Jesus in there, aren't we? And of course the first chapter elaborates quite significantly about, about Jesus. Let me just share a note uh, with you here regarding this, uh, this, passage, this little package here we just looked at. I, I found this, um, this little note I'm going to share with you in, in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary regarding this verse. It says, words denoting visual communication and perception occur 73 times in the book of Revelation. So in terms of John said, I saw this or I was shown that, uh, something appeared to me. It's all about this visual communication that God was using to get the message across to John in order that he might pass it on, of course, to us. 73 times uh, using visual communication and also 38 times words denoting audio communication are used also there as God seeks to communicate this message to John. And so these various forms uh, and methods uh, God employs here to communicate to us. This process of sending it through Jesus, concerning him, right through the angel, to the leaders of the church, and then onwards it's been written, it's been transmitted, it's been compiled, it's been edited, and it's been brought down to us 2,000 years later. An absolutely amazing process because this is a message for today, isn't it? How much of the book of Revelation was relevant when it was written? I would suggest virtually none of it. It's only as history has, been, uh, has undergone its uh, process that it has become relevant. 
And likewise, the book of Daniel. In fact, the book of Daniel was closed up and sealed until the time of the end. But the book of Revelation is, is being specifically written for the end time people. And so God's intention was that it be recorded, that it be preserved and kept and uh, translated into our languages. You know, many here have uh, English as a second language. And I assume that some of you at least still go back to your mother tongue and read the Bible in your own language in order that the communication process be, might be more effective. Uh, you know, I have the opportunity to be able to read some measure of Greek. Uh, I have no clue about Hebrew, but it is helpful sometimes for me to go back and read the original Greek of the New Testament and uh, helps provide deeper understanding or better effective communication of what God's message is. So let us, um, let us think about where it goes on to immediately after that verse and you can notice in Revelation, if you want to open your Bibles there, Revelation chapter 1, notice what it says in verse 3 here regarding uh, what we've just been speaking of. Verse 3 says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. So here God promises a blessing, first of all, to that, that person, that individual who reads the words of this prophecy in their local context. So this, uh, these messages were sent out to the churches of Asia and the leader of that church was given the responsibility of reading it out. And I guess the idea was that he would read it out in a way that it would be effective in terms of its communication. Secondly, there's a, pr a promise uh, a promised blessing to those who hear what is being read. Now, I'm sure you can all hear me. Everybody can hear okay? Yes? But hearing is much more than just actually the tickling the auditory nerve, I'm sure. The hearing must go a little bit deeper, mustn't it? It's hearing with understanding. And I hope I'm at least somewhat effective. I'm not the best preacher in the world, but... Uh, hopefully I'm being a little bit effective in communicating what I'm trying to get across. And hopefully in time it will even come more clear, become more clear. And, but thirdly, he says there's a promised blessing upon those who actually keep what has been written in this book. Now, it would be either dysfunctional or impossible to try and keep something that you don't properly understand. Now, I say dysfunctional because you may have a, a misconception of what it's actually saying. And therefore, your response and the way you, res the way you respond to that may be not appropriate. And uh, I guess I could uh, give illustrations of how uh, people who are Christians, or they, they claim to be Christians, they claim to follow the Bible, and yet they misrepresent Christianity. And I'm not questioning their sincerity but some, many, many people have a misconception of what Christianity is truly about. They live a dysfunctional Christian life. And I believe it's a sincere miscomprehension or, or a misunderstanding of the intent, the purpose of what God has revealed to them. And I hope and pray that uh, when we are uh, seeking to represent Jesus as his ambassadors, we don't do so in a dysfunctional way which puts a barrier between bringing people to Jesus. You know, miscommunication can be done in a, in a variety of ways. For example, we may be seeking to um, encourage people to follow the teachings of the Bible. They may be a very new believer, and there, there may be some here today, in fact, who are new believers or who are still seeking to understand the Bible without actually having made any kind of commitment to Jesus. But as we uh, seek to communicate to those people, that we, we may need to be careful that we don't put the cart before the horse and miscommunicate uh, to them. You know, perhaps the first thing we ought to prioritise is introducing them to, to Jesus. You know, the one who created the world, the one who came down to our world and gave his life in order to save us from our, our condition of sin. And the one who promised to come back again and re-establish uh, the rest, the, the, to restore the relationship that's been broken with God. 
before we then introduce them to other aspects of the, of the biblical teachings. And, um, you know, I, I have myself been guilty of urging a more perhaps legalistic approach to Christianity than a gospel-oriented approach. And uh, I, I think of my own son, whom I, you know, basically insisted on him behaving in a certain way rather than giving them, him the freedom that, uh, that God gives me in the way I behave and the way I relate to God. And so sometimes we, we perhaps create a dysfunctional way of people, of introducing people to Jesus. And beyond that, of course, some people are sincerely uh, ignorant of what God is actually trying to say to them. And we uh, need to be careful that we, we do our utmost by God's grace to communicate in, in an effective way. I have something in my mind I'm trying to get across. I'm using words, uh, maybe I'm using uh, illustrations or analogies, or maybe even images. Uh, Barrett is very good at using imagery to communicate. Um, <clears throat> other professional uh, preachers and public speakers have other techniques. In fact, um, my son's girlfriend is a coach, a bit of an expert, in using this technique called neuro-linguistic programming. And um, I'm somewhat frightened of talking to her because <laughs> I don't want to be programmed by some of those potentially inappropriate ways of uh, communicating and uh, getting people to accept what you're, or com what you're trying to communicate to them. And so there are inappropriate methods of communicating that we, we may not want to embrace as Christians. But certainly there are methods we need to employ if we want to be effective. And so that's why Jesus said we need to be as wise as serpents and yet harmless as doves. We treat people with kindness and respect and love and, uh, and patience. But at the same time, we, we, uh, we keep uh, moving along, helping to move them along on this process of coming to a deeper and richer understanding of the gospel message. And I guess all of us are in this... Uh, in a process of learning and uh, growing in our relationship with God and our understanding of the gospel. I, for one, uh, am happy to say that over my many years now of being a Christian, I've grown immensely. You know, my early days of Christianity were, well, I look back now, somewhat superficial and shallow. But now over many, many years, and I don't mean to be boastful, but I just thank God that you know, by, by listening to sermons, by listening to music and songs, by reading God's word and, and other decent quality Christian literature, I've deepened in my understanding as I've meditated and contemplated the things that I've read and learnt. They have they've helped me to grow and uh, have a deeper understanding of what, uh, uh, what God is like and the way in which he wants to draw us to himself and, of course, also help us to draw others to himself. So the key to hearing, as the, the blessing was promised to those who hear and to those who keep, the key issue there is understanding. If we are not able to communicate with understanding, we are failing. And I, when I had this experience with my sister last week, it made me wonder, over all these years of standing before audiences or congregations of people and sharing from the Word of God, I've it really challenged me to ask, you know, how effective have I been? I know I'm not a, um, you know, a world-class preacher like David Asherick or, or um, Gary Kent or, or Doug Batchelor or people like that who, are, who have a very powerful gift in communicating. But I heard uh, um, Doug Batchelor not too long ago say that uh, somebody had come to him one, at one meeting and said, Whenever I can't uh, sleep at night, I love to turn on the television and, and watch you preaching because it puts me to sleep. And uh, I thought, well, I mean, it's not only me, so it made me feel a lot better. But, but nonetheless, um, you know, someone was just saying out the front here just before we came in that uh, they're going to come inside and go to sleep. Was it you, Adele? No, was it you? I wasn't sure if it was you. Oh, no, it was Neela. That's right. I got still see she's uh, smiling, so that's good. Now, I want to just move on to another, another story in the Bible. Um, some people will re really resonate with this character. His name is Nehemiah. And, of course, Nehemiah um, lived during the time of the captivity. 
The people of Judah were taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar. They went to Babylon. Jeremiah had predicted they would be there for 70 years. Then he would allow them to return to their homeland, to their city, to re-establish themselves as God's own people. And so Nehemiah was there at that, at that period of time. And uh, Babylon, of course, had been overthrown. The Medo-Persian Empire had come to supremacy. Nehemiah had a very, very prominent position in the court of the king of the Medo-Persians. His name was Artaxerxes. And Nehemiah was his cupbearer, a very honoured and privileged and uh, trusted position, of course, because I guess in theory, at least, he would be the one that would drink from the wine cup before the king was allowed to drink it in case someone had put some poison in there. So Nehemiah was a very, very trusted servant of the king of the Medo-Persians. But uh, he had this great burden on his heart. He had heard that back in Jerusalem, the walls were broken down, the city was in disrepair, the temple, of course, had been destroyed, the people were, were heartbroken, the 70 years of captivity had already ended, some people had already returned back to Jerusalem, but the work of rebuilding was going very, very slowly. There was opposition to what they were trying to, doing, to, to do. They were, they were being mocked by the local uh, people. And so Nehemiah prayed and fasted and he determined he would go into the king and according to God's will, he would seek permission to return to Jerusalem and help get this work of rebuilding underway. And uh, to cut a long story short, out of Xerxes granted his request. He allowed him to go back. He gave him all sorts of authority to gain building materials and finances and protection from soldiers. And so he went back. And the work of rebuilding went on. So it's a fascinating story. If you just read the first seven chapters of Nehemiah, you could do it in half an hour easily. It's a powerful story of this man's faith and his love for his people and his desire for God to be honoured. He couldn't stand the thought of the city of God being in disrepair as it was. And so he came back and he inspired and uh, motivated the people there. There was tens of thousands, I can't remember the exact number there, but quite a significant number, but only relatively small in terms of the size of the city. They rebuilt the walls, they rebuilt the gates, they were mocked and tormented, they were threatened. They fought, uh, they, they built the walls with their trowel in one hand and their spear in the other. And uh, so the work progressed until finally they were able to feel secure. The walls were all built, the gates were able to be locked. And so it came time now to not only rebuild their fortress, if you like, the walls around their city, but now came time for them to rebuild their relationship with God. And it says in the text that the people actually called for the leaders, the religious leaders, to, to bring the books. And of course, this was the, what we know as the Torah or the Pentateuch, the first five books, the books of Moses, the scrolls they would have had back there, of course, to bring them out. And uh, they wanted to hear what had been recorded there. But remember, of course, this is a two or three generations after they had been taken captive. And, and for generations before that, of course, they'd been unfaithful to God. They'd drifted away from God into idolatry and mixed marriages and all sorts of things, Sabbath breaking. And so they had drifted a long way away from God. But here they were now, uh, and they were seeking for the leaders of the church to to read to them, to teach them, to instruct them what the Word of God actually said. And for them, of course, the Torah was the ultimate in God's revelation to them. And of course, to us, we look back, and of course, it is extremely foundational to our self-understanding and our relationship to God. We have the law of God there, we have the story of creation and so on. Now, I want to just uh, notice here some points from this. Uh, in verse 2, um, it says that they began to teach and to preach and share uh, to the people of understanding. So the men, the women and uh, younger people were called together. Those who had, under those had the ability to comprehend were gathered together at, uh, I think it's one of, the, one of the gates there it mentioned. Um, I must not have written it down, but nonetheless, oh yeah, the water gate. It seems that this was a place that could contain many thousands of people. 
And so they gather there, all the people of understanding. And notice, um, let's, let's just have a look back there in the text, if we could, at uh, Nehemiah chapter 8. And we'll just pick up a couple of points from verse 2 and 3. So Nehemiah is back before the book of Psalms, before Job, um, in that vicinity just there, just before Esther, I think. <coughs> just before Esther, yes. Nehemiah chapter 8. Notice verse 2 to start with. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of women, uh, men and women and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. Now, does anybody recall the significance of the first day of the seventh month in the Hebrew Jewish calendar? I'm not sure the names of the month, but do you remember the festival that was being celebrated there? Yeah, the Feast of Trumpets, that's correct. So on the first day of the seventh month, it was the beginning of the Feast of Trumpets. And so this is very significant because you see where this is heading. Of course, after the Feast of Trumpets came the Day of Atonement and then the Feast of Tabernacles. So very significant uh, time in the Jewish um, religious calendar. So here they were gathered there, all the people who could understand. Verse 3 says, Then he read, this is Ezra the priest, it says that he read from it, from these scrolls, he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday. He was before in front of the men and women and those who could understand. And notice this point, and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Now these people weren't just turning up for a social event. These people weren't just turning up there because mum dragged them along. These people weren't there because of any nominal uh, relationship with God. These people wanted to know what was contained in these books or in these scrolls. And it says that they, as they read here for hours, how many hours? From the morning until midday, perhaps three to four to five hours, um, it says that the ears of all the people were attentive. They were listening intently. They wanted to understand, didn't they? And uh, it's really good to hear that these priests and Levites and preachers that had the responsibility there took their responsibilities very, very seriously. Notice what it goes on to say, just down a little further here. Verse 4, Ezra the scribe stood on a platform. Now, it was made out of wood. It was like a pulpit, I suppose you could say. It was raised about a metre and a half high, about two and a half metres square. And it resembled what Solomon had built when they dedicated the original temple that had been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. His was made of bronze. But they made this wooden platform so he could be raised up and the people could look up and, and see and hear what he was saying. It's actually the opposite of what we do here. You know, we have the lecture theatre with the opposite configuration. You look down upon me and I'm comfortable with that. Uh, but in those days, of course, and even in many churches, traditionally the, the pulpit is raised up, isn't it? And it's to give primacy to the word of God, isn't it? To raise it up, to put it up there before the people. And so I hope that uh, whether we be at church or in your home, the Bible is given primacy. It's the most important thing that, uh, in terms of our relationship with God that we have, or perhaps barring my concluding statements. And so these uh, people, they, the story continues on here. Look in verses uh, 5 and 6. Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. These people were not going to fall asleep, Neela. They wanted to catch every word that was being spoken to them. Well, these people took their, their uh, interest in these things very, very seriously. And it goes on in verse 6 to say, Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. So he, he, he offered a word of prayer and praise to God. And then all the people answered and said, Amen, Amen, while they lifted up their hands. Now, I'm not necessarily encouraging us to lift up our hands, but it does say in the New Testament, actually, that men, holy men should pray with uplifted hands. So anyway, the point is, again, there's, there's, 
it's just a demonstration of these people engaging in this worship opportunity. They're worshipping God. They're focused and meditating upon what the priests are saying as they're reading it from the scriptures. And all the people stood up. Now, um, lift up their hands. And then it says, they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Here is a, a demonstration of humility and reverence and awe. They recognised what was going on here as a holy event. God was with them. These men were men of God. They had with them the words of God and they had been far away from God for, for many a long year. 70 years of captivity, perhaps a few more years in the rebuilding process. And before that, of course, how far had they drifted? For how long had they drifted before that captivity eventually got allowed to take place because of their wickedness? But here they are now. They are just deeply intent in hearing and understanding what the words of God's book had to say to them. And here, the main point in the next, very next verse, in verse 8, or not the next verse, but we skip past. Um, oh no, we'll go to verse 7. A number of these priests and Levites are mentioned by name. I'll let you read them yourself because they're a little bit difficult to pronounce and my communication might be faulty there. But it goes on to say that these people and the Levites helped the people to understand the law. They helped the people to understand. So as I read through a number of commentaries and different, uh, different uh, ideas, they suggested that perhaps various of these people moved out amongst the people and answered their questions. As the priests and the Levites read out from the pulpit up the front, others mingled out around amongst the people there and if they had any questions about what it meant, they would be able to speak with them and answer their questions. And the people, it says, they helped the people understand the law. And the, the key verse here is this next verse, verse 8, where it says, and speaking of these people up the front on the, on the platform there, it says, and so they read distinctly from the book in the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. These people were determined to be effective in the way they communicated what God had given them. The word of God was what they were sharing, wasn't it? The Torah, the first five books. And it, by the way, it didn't finish on this morning. This, this process underwent for, for quite some time. But the point is that the people were eager to learn and the leaders of the people were eager to ensure that what they were sharing was not only heard, but understood. And so we, as a um, church, if you like, and we as individuals, also need to take very seriously whether we are being effective in what we have been commissioned to communicate. Now, whether this be with our young children at home, you know, using simple songs and teaching to pray and story books, Bible stories and so on. We have children upstairs at the moment. I see our friend brother Tim here is with us today and he has two beautiful little children. I'm sure that mum and dad spend time seeking to effectively communicate the good news of Jesus' love for those little ones. And whether it be in that context or whether it be a work colleague that uh, may be abrupt and dismissive or even rude to what we, in our attempts to try and share good news with them, we, are still, uh, we still carry that responsibility to break through those kind of barriers and get the message across, don't we? Every single one of those people is precious. And you know, oftentimes when people are like that, when they become um, belligerent, or perhaps um, even aggressive toward us, maybe that's when they are sensing the conviction of the Holy Spirit most powerfully and it makes them draw back. They don't, they makes it, God, God makes them feel uncomfortable. And maybe then we need to whisper a prayer, Lord, help me to choose my words carefully. Help me, Lord, to have the appropriate disposition, the tone of voice, the expression on my face, you know, the look in my eyes, 
They all, they all communicate a lot, don't they? I've heard it said that our commission is to go and preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. You know, the way we relate to our, our work associates, our neighbours, other random people we might come across, will be communicating something one way or another. Whether it's positive or negative, or it's effective or ineffective, whether we leave them with unanswered questions, whether we um, are able to arouse an interest, um, will be large, or in part at least, determined by our approach. The words we might use, the strategy, the method we may employ, the, uh, the body language, and so forth. The appropriateness of that time we may be in. In the book of Revelation, God has recorded for us as a people, and I'm not sure there may be some here who are not entirely aware of this, but we believe the messages contained in Revelation 14 have been given to us uh, particularly to share with the world. And the message goes something like this. John was the one who recorded this. He was shown this in vision. He said, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to all the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue and people. So here is portrayed in, a, in this visionary format to John, this uh, image of an angel flying up in the sky, crying out with a loud voice, and the message is to go to all the world. Every single individual needs to hear this message. Now, at first I'd like to just ask the question, when it says this angel was using a loud voice, do you think that means he was just shouting? And by the way, the angel here is simply a messenger and uh, we ought to put ourselves in that place. We are the messengers, aren't we? That God has called upon to share this everlasting gospel. So do you think it's just a loud voice that we need to employ? I think not. I think what we're looking at here is effective means of communication. Clarity. Um, let me see, I've, I've written down a few words here I want to use because I chose them carefully. We need to speak with um, clarity, with a sense of urgency, with a, a clear sense of conviction that we actually believe in what we're saying and perhaps most importantly, with a sense of humility. So the loud voice is, I believe, indicating effective communication. Now, whether that be done through all the modern mass media we have at our disposal, I think they're all helpful tools. But primarily, God is looking for messengers like you and myself to be out there as wise as serpents, as harmless as doves, seeking to share the good news, the good news that Jesus loves every single one of us, he has a plan to use each of us in completing this task of bringing the gospel to all the world. You know, we as a church denomination are only about 18 million strong with a population of 7 billion people. It cannot be done by a handful of uh, professionals. You know, God wants each and every one of us to be willing to be used. It doesn't mean we all will turn out like high-profile international speakers. Some of you may. Others may do a quiet work in the home or in the neighbourhood or in the workplace and uh, help introduce people to Jesus. You know, the other day, Barrett and myself and a number of others were discussing how we go about sharing the gospel. And uh, I referred to that verse there in the uh, first angel crying out with a loud voice. He, he of all, Barrett, first of all, had said that we need to do it sensitively and quietly and not, not be pushy. We don't want to Bible bash people. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to do the work of convicting people. We just have to share the message. And I said, yes, but the Bible says we need to do it with a loud voice, you know, with conviction and clarity and certainty, but with humility. And he said, yes, but the second angel 
He doesn't use a loud voice. It's just come out of Babylon. Just come out of Babylon. Come out of Babylon. Babylon has fallen. And I said, yes, but the message of Revelation 18, notice what it says. The message is to be given not with a loud voice, but do you recall? Revelation 18 and verse 2. Uh, John saw another angel coming down from heaven having great authority. The earth was illuminated with his glory and he cried mightily with a loud voice. And I believe, uh, I seriously believe that God is wanting us to sharpen our tools, sharpen our weapons, learn to be effective in the way that we proclaim with this loud voice as it speaks, so to speak, the message to those we love, to those that we have influence over, to those that we may meet on the street as strangers. We've spoken this morning in Sabbath school at length about how we ought to interact with the less fortunate. And certainly, um, I think Jamie made the point here at least that throwing a few dollars to them to buy them a meal is not the, um, the ideal way of relating to these people. It may uh, satisfy the hunger for a, a few hours, but uh, what they're looking for is something more precious than that, and that is love and acceptance. And our time, of course, is what is needed to give to these sort of people, to any people, in fact. Um, and I think Jamie also made the point, it's not necessarily the poorest of society that are really poor. Perhaps it's the people who don't recognise their need because they are so materially wealthy that they don't realise they have so much actual lack. In John chapter 16 and verse 25, it says this, These things I've spoken, this is Jesus speaking on the night of his betrayal, These things I've spoken to you in figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. So Jesus himself, it says he spoke all things in parables, in fact. But uh, here he's saying that the time is coming very soon when he will not speak in figurative or, or parables or this sort of thing, but he'll speak very plainly. And what he was actually saying was, if you read the rest of the context here, he was saying that the Holy Spirit will come with such conviction that the communication process will be done. And uh, as, as sharp as we make our tools or our weapons in our endeavour to be effective in communicating the gospel, one thing is always going to be essential, and that is the ministry of the Holy Spirit for us in learning and understanding for ourselves what it is that we are called upon to communicate, but also the Holy Spirit working in the hearts and minds of our audience, whether they be our children, our family members, our loved ones, our neighbours, whoever they may be, without the influence and the direct uh, assistance, if you like, of the Holy Spirit in, in what we're called to do, we will be ineffective We cannot do the work of transforming individuals' hearts. That is the work of God, isn't it? And so in concluding today, we want to just remind ourselves that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. We can use the internet, we can use satellites, we can use all sorts of modern mass media techniques, television ministry and all those are fine. We can go out and preach public campaigns, prophecy seminars, health seminars. We can come to work church each week here and welcome people in from the campus to come and join us and be a part of what we're doing here each Sabbath. We can do all of that. But if we're doing it in our own strength, in our own wisdom, we will surely fall short. Only as we employ, if, if uh, that's a, perhaps not a good way of putting it, awkward way of saying it, but only as we allow the Holy Spirit to be a part of what we're doing will we see true success. And so we we have the textbook, we have the blueprint of what God wants us to do, we have uh, many other uh, resources at our disposal which will give us um, methodology that is safe, God-ordained, but 
primarily we need to be prayerfully asking God to be with us as we seek to speak a word in season to those that we have influence over, contact with, and uh, by God's grace, the communication of God's, the mind and heart of God through this long, dangerous process, by God's grace, through his spirit, will reach the target, the heart of these people who are still without an, a, a deep understanding of God's love for them. And so as we conclude, we're going to invite our, our youth choir to come and uh, share with us a, a song that will speak to our hearts and bring honour to God. So thank you uh, to our young people for that today. contact I visit with each week. His name is Bill. And uh, Bill requested to have Bible studies. He said he wanted to become a Christian. And I won't go into his personal background experiences, but over a, a, just a few weeks I've seen, um, like I, my background, I spent 20 years driving bulldozers before I was called into ministry. And um, Neil Schofield would probably say bulldozer, driver by career and also by nature. And uh, I'm a bit, I can be a bit gruff and rough and every day in the way I communicate to people. But Bill has uh, resonated with the way in which I have been sharing with him. And uh, I can uh, testify that the Spirit of God has been at work in his life, not just with me being there with him, but as he's been on this journey over the past several weeks, and uh, I shared with him just a, just a brief insight into the gospel two or three weeks ago and 
It brought him to tears. You could see the Spirit of God working upon him as he realised his need of Jesus in his life more than he had ever before. He, kn- he knew, he sensed that God was calling him. And uh, it was such a, a moving experience to see God working upon this. I mean, he's a middle-aged man. Well, what's middle-aged? About Christiana's age? <laughs> Somewhere in the mid-30s, anyway. Maybe not quite middle-aged. I think I'm probably more middle-aged. But anyway, here's a man, just a, a man that's had a big struggle and he recognised he needed help. And as I, was, I had that opportunity to share with him that day and, and, and other occasions since, I've just been so blessed to be a part of sharing something of value, the gospel, with him. And so um, there's many, many bills out there that are waiting for people like you and me, regardless of our background, regardless of our experience, to go and befriend them and share something we know about Jesus. And uh, I pray that you're praying for those opportunities to be given to you. I believe if we're praying for souls, if we're praying for someone to share with, God will lead you to someone may be fearful, but nonetheless, I believe as we go out in faith and launch out with a willingness to be used by God, he will lead us to people and we'll have the opportunity to communicate the gospel to them. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that we're able to be here today. The freedom and the peace we can enjoy and experience here. We thank you for our church family and we thank you for the Bible and the message it uh, provides to us. The good news of your love for each one. The privilege of being called to serve and to share and to pass on the message of salvation to this dying world. And we pray, Lord, that each of us will have a sense of conviction that uh, there is work for us to do. There is something that we can do with the gifts and talents we have that you've given to us. We pray, Father, that you'll give us that sense that uh, you are calling to us to reach out to others. Lord, we again thank you for Jesus, for he is the heart and soul of this good news that we have to share. And as we meditate upon the scriptures in our daily devotions, may we find Jesus there. May our love for him be renewed and strengthened and our desire to share him with others be be strengthened too. Lord, bless our fellowship this afternoon as we enjoy some food together. May your spirit remain with us. May we uh, experience the peace and the joy that comes from you. And so thank you again, Father, for hearing our prayer today and we commit our lives to you now at the end of this gathering in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all, folks. Have a wonderful week. Look forward to having a chat with you outside.